All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for watching. My name is Nick Phillips. I'm a reporter with the Arizona Capital Times, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this event. As the state's voter education agency, Clean Elections hosts debates so voters have the opportunity to hear directly from the candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter most to them, and vote informed. Candidates that have a contested primary election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates that have opted into the Clean Elections Clean Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates are invited and encouraged to attend. I think we have seven traditional candidates this evening, so thank you all for being here. Um, candidates from both the House and Senate are participating in the debate tonight. When voting in a primary election, voters are choosing between candidates of the same political party, so their preferred nominee may advance to the general election. As a moderator, I'm going to ensure the candidates have the opportunity to engage directly with their respective opponents. The questions that will be asked this evening are coming directly from voters. Leading up to the debates, Clean Elections conducted outreach to voters across the state asking for questions for the candidates. Additionally, Clean Elections surveyed voters to learn what issues are important to them, and this survey data, along with input from journalists at the Arizona Capital Times, the Arizona Agenda, the Green Valley News and the Salarita Sun have been utilized to guide the discussion so it best serves voters. And of course, we want to hear directly from you, the voter. So if you're watching this debate live, you can submit a question at any time by email, by emailing debates at kc-a.com or by sending a text to 480-808-1814. Or by phone by calling the number 480 937 1253. And I'll just repeat those contacts right now in case you're watching live. The email again is debates at kc a.com. The number to text is 480 808 1814. And the number to call is 480 937 one, two, five, three. And if you do call or send in a question, please specify if that's for a specific candidate or for all candidates. We screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. We don't need that. Um, and this debate is scheduled for an hour to 90 minutes. So we might not get to all audience questions, but we'll do our best. And to the candidates who are about to speak, uh, You'll have one minute for your opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for your responses to voter questions. We encourage an open exchange of dialogue between opponents. So if you feel the need to respond to another candidate's comments, you may do so. Um, I might limit responses for time management purposes. And I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, this is a respectful, courteous and professional environment. Our goal tonight is to connect candidates and voters so that the electorate may vote informed. Okay, so I'm gonna do a quick rundown of the candidates. Uh, we have two candidates for Senate, and I'll say right now, uh, I'm gonna do my best, but if you'd like to correct my pronunciation of your name, please do so. Um, so for Senate, we have uh, Morgan Abraham and Priya Sundareshan. For House, we have Nathan Davis, Nancy Gutierrez, Chris Mathis, Kat Stratford, and Charlie Verdon. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned already, but uh, all of you folks are Democrats, so this is a this is a Democratic primary debate this evening. Um, okay, um, and the order in which you folks are going to speak, uh, well, it's the order in which I read your names right now, but that was determined by alphabetical order by last name and starting with the Senate. And so we're going to start in that order, and then I'll uh, rotate through so that it's not always uh, Morgan leading off. Um, but for starters, we will go to Morgan first. Um, so Morgan, if you'd like to begin with your opening statement, uh, you have one minute. Perfect. Well, thank you for being here. Thank uh, all the viewers for being informed. My name is Morgan Abraham, and I've spent my life working to make Southern Arizona a better place to live, work, and raise a family. As a small business owner, I've created thousands of affordable housing units. 
As an army intelligence officer, I've fought to protect and defend our country. And as a state representative, I've introduced bills to get rid of tax loopholes to fund education, create a public pre-K system, retire coal and natural gas plants, and increase the supply of affordable housing in our community. As an education advocate, I fought against the draconian cuts harming our public schools, colleges, and universities, uh, Jan Brewer's tuition hikes, and Doug Ducey's education funding cuts. I will always stand up for education. I'm running for the state Senate to keep pushing for these progressive values and to fight back, push back against the Republican legislature and their bills that are threatening our right to vote. I have the experience, the energy, and the enthusiasm to get the job done. And with your support, I'll keep fighting for Southern Arizona values at the state Senate. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Morgan. We'll move to Priya. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Priya Sundaration. I am running for state Senate in LD18. I was born and raised in the district and attended public education um, schools in the district as well. And I want to make sure that the fabulous public education that I received here in the district is available to all Arizona children. Uh, I teach natural resources law at the University of Arizona uh, and come, come to that from a career in environmental advocacy. So I will be making sure that um, environmental issues, climate change, renewable energy, and water issues are a big focus of my time in the legislature. I also have been a voting rights advocate for a few years now and have uh, worked really hard to fight against the voter suppression laws that our legislature is currently passing uh, and make sure, I wanna make sure that voting is accessible to all. I'm a union member and I'm also the mom to two young children. So I'm running for the legislature and I'm running for the Senate to make sure that Arizona is a sustainable, thriving, prosperous place for my children and all children across Arizona to grow up in into the future. Thanks. Thanks, Priya. All right, we're going to move on to our candidates for House, starting with Mr. Davis. All right, thank you. My name is Nathan Davis. I'm running for the Arizona House in LD18. <clears throat> I was born and raised here in Southern Arizona. Um, I attended public schools uh, throughout in, in Amphitheater District. I am the proud product of both that, of, of those public schools and public education, um, as well as of my parents. My dad was a special education teacher in TUSD. My mom runs a small family business. I ended up following in both of their footsteps. Uh, when I came back from, uh, when I came back to Tucson after uh, graduate school, I went into public education. I taught middle school social studies for several years. Um, and eventually I left the classroom uh, and joined my family's business here in the foothills. I'm running because of my experience as a, both running a small business and as an educator. Um, I'm not running because the next few years are, are gonna be absolutely critical. What I'm running for is because Arizona is on the wrong track um, and we must invest in public education, um, combat climate change, defend our democracy from attacks within and expand uh, healthcare access, including protecting legal abortion care. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. We'll move to Ms. Gutierrez. Hi, my name is Nancy Gutierrez and I'm a teacher at Tucson High. I'm also a union member. I'm running for this office to save and protect public schools in Arizona. Every student deserves a quality and equitable education. The party in charge has systematically torn apart public education with budget cuts and vouchers that give public money to private and charter schools with no oversight. We shouldn't have schools with no air conditioning and tiles coming up off the floor or where teachers have to travel across campus several times a day just to get a classroom where they can teach safely. We can't lower the standards to become a teacher in this state because we've underfunded them for so long that teachers are forced to leave our profession to be able to house and feed their families. I will be a teacher's voice in our house. I will use my experience, leadership, knowledge, and help rebuild our public education system while at the same time fighting for women, reproductive rights, trans rights for my trans students, our environment and voter rights. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Mathis. 
Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Clean Elections, and all uh, of the candidates and all the viewers. I'm Chris Mathis. I am a law professor and lawyer in Tucson. Uh, I am uh, running for election to the House in order to try to bring some of our Tucson values to Phoenix. Uh, those include protecting our voting rights uh, and our reproductive rights, investing in public education, and also doing everything that we can to preserve our water and fight climate change. Uh, I am the proud product of uh, public schools, both uh, K through 12 and went to a land grant institu institution. I'm also an Arizona education member. I think the most important thing that all of us can do in Phoenix is to uh, do everything we possibly can to preserve our public education, which as others have said, is under attack in Arizona and has been for quite a while. I look forward to uh, the debate, listen to the other candidates. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Stratford. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Kat Stratford, and I wanna share a little bit about why I'm running. When I first decided to leave my abuser, I had a newborn daughter and a toddler, and I knew I would need childcare. I called DES, but I was informed that I, I would need a job in order to apply for her child care assistance. But of course, I would need that assistance in order to apply for a job. This meant that I had to stay in a very dangerous situation for four more years until my children were old enough for public school. In a state where we lose a life every three days due to a domestic violence incident, this is unacceptable. How many lives are we hemorrhaging due to bad policies like this? The answer is obviously too many. And I don't think it's because lawmakers are necessarily indifferent. I think it's because these problems are hidden until you run into them. And that's why I'm here. Survivors and single parents need representation. So my name is Kat Stratford. I'm a single parent to a trans child and a gay child. I'm a member of the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, and I'm a working class candidate who represents a lot of constituencies and I'm here to fight for those communities in our collective future. I wanna help more people escape the circumstances that I did and I don't want them to have to face the same obstacles that I had to. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. And our final opening statement will be from Mr. Verdon. Hello everybody, I'm Charlie Verdon. I'm one of the owners of an online retailer called Fan Gamer based here in Tucson. I'm the father of two small children who will be in public schools in just a few years, so education is a big concern for me. I'm also a member of the Pawnishant Indian tribe from South Louisiana. My tribe's ancestral land has largely disappeared due to uh, erosion over the past few decades, in part due to corporate negligence, government mis uh, mismanagement, and climate change. So I'm very committed to making sure my new home here in the desert remains inhabitable for the foreseeable future. Uh, our biggest challenge uh, right now is our dwindling water supply, a problem we absolutely need to address as soon as possible. Uh, well, I'm just going to move on. Uh, uh, my name is Charlie Verdon. Uh, I hope you'll give me the opportunity to serve you in the legislature. I am a clean elections candidate, so I encourage you to donate five, uh, a $5 qualifying contribution to my ca campaign online via the EQUAL system in the Arizona uh, Secretary of State's website. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, folks. And uh, I'll apologize to you, Mr. Verdon. I said at the beginning that we had all traditional candidates here, so that must have been a mistake on my end, but we do have one clean uh, one candidate running clean here. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, and now we get to move into the fun stuff, uh, which are the questions. So uh, the first one, uh, we're going to start with Ms. Sundarayshan. And uh, you guys can kind of just take note of the order you're in. Uh, now, Mr. Abraham, you were first last time. So you're going to be last this time. And we're going to keep going in this, uh, in this rotation. Um, and the first question, uh, we'll start off with a question about the economy. Governor Doug Ducey won office, pledging to cut state income taxes as close to zero as possible. But we've also had voters in our state who approved Proposition 208, which raised income taxes on the wealthy to better fund education. So what are voters telling policymakers with these votes? And at what rate do you think Arizonans should have their income taxed? I think that um, it's clear that voters in Arizona want there to be more funding for public education. And we saw that as the most recent vote. You, the question set up the election of Governor Ducey in 2018, but more recently we did pass Prop 208, which would fund education 
um, and provide a funding source. Um, unfortunately, Prop 208, we're, we're seeing multiple attacks coming from the Republicans and um, other foes of, of education funding. And it's a really crushing defeat even today, just the headlines that, um, that uh, the effort to undo the flat tax that would cut the source of funding for Prop 208 um, is, being, is being reduced. Um, to nothing. So what we need to do is follow the lead of the voters. Most recently, we voted to fund public education, and we should absolutely do that. The state is sitting on a five over $5 billion surplus. The lawmakers, um, some of whom are here and fighting the good fight, thank you both, um, are, are refusing to pass a, a skinny budget that does not include education funding, and I absolutely applaud that effort. We need to provide um, funding for education as much as is legally possible um, through that surplus and apply that surplus to other public needs. Okay, thank you. We'll go to Mr. Davis. So Governor Ducey was elected in 2018. Um, last year or in 2020, the voters approved Prop 208. I think that one of the things that's incredibly important is that we respect elections. And I think that one of the things that we saw is that the current majority does not respect elections. Um, 208 was passed by the people. Um, we, as a state said, we're not spending enough on education and those at the top of the income ladder have enough to contribute a little bit more. What the legislature did was refuse to ensure that the law that Prop 208 went into effect. And that is what the recent court ruling said, that if the legislature had acted, Prop 208 would have gone into effect. This was an, a, a choice by the legislative majority to kill what would have been uh, more than half a billion dollars into our public education system. What I am running for is <clears throat> to protect our constitutional rights as Arizonans our constitutional right to um, quality public education um, from K-12, K including university, um, as well as our constitutional right to the initiative. Um, I did not see the report on the efforts to uh, uh, repeal uh, the last year's SB, I think it was 1828, um, the flat tax. Um, but if uh, that goes before the voters, I am uh, in favor of voting no on Prop 307, which would have the effect of repealing last year's flat taxes. The main thing that's going on here is that we have a legislative majority and a governor who are afraid of the people. They're, and that's why they're trying to kill the initiative uh, or the referendum on last year's flat tax. I want that to go forward. I want the people to weigh in. If the voters, if majority of voters agree with Governor Ducey, then that is the direction that they have chosen. But it is important that our voice, that your voice is not hurt and, and, and is allowed to be heard. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. Um, I'm happy to speak right now, but I think we did skip Mr. Abraham. Uh, so we're, uh, we're going to rotate the order so that uh, Nobody has to keep going first because that kind of puts you on the hot seat. You have to answer. Okay, right away. got it. I just so thought he's we were going to be last with... this time. Okay, I just that's very generous. Of you, I, well, I thought we were doing Senate together, no matter what. So great. All right, I'll take my turn then. Um, unfortunately, today Prop 10 or 307 will not go to the voters. Uh, that was just decided by a skewed Supreme Arizona Supreme Court. So we will not get to vote on that, even though many of us spent long, hot summers uh, this, this past summer getting lots of signatures to get that on the ballot. So um, in answer to the question, does Doug Ducey care about what the voters say? That answer is absolutely, he does not. Um, we have said uh, that we wanted education funding increased time and time again. We have said that we do not want vouchers expanded time and time again, and he and our Republican-led legislature do not listen to that. We are so underfunded in education that, uh, I mean, we really, at Tucson High right now, we are dealing with classrooms with no air conditioning. We are dealing with classrooms that are not able to be used because of asbestos. This is unacceptable. 
many of our teachers have left this year because we haven't had a raise. That 2020 Red for Ed movement that I was a part of, we never got a 20% raise. Um, so the voters keep talking to um, our legislature and our governor, and we're continually not heard, um, which is one of the main reasons why I am running, just to be that teacher's voice, to stand up for us and fight, because I've seen what the pandemic has done to our classrooms, and I've seen what the past years of underfunding has done. Um, I don't think there should be a flat tax in Arizona. That's going to create another billion dollars in surplus. We already have over $5 billion in surplus right now. We don't need seven. Um, we need to spend the money that we have in our budget on education, on water conservation, on um, protecting our voters' rights and continuing to have safe elections. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mathis, you're up. Yeah, I just, uh, as, uh, as Nancy and others have said, this situation is unacceptable. And also, the, I think the question presents, I understand the question, but it presents a little bit of a false choice. We can have uh, low tax rates, we can have a good business environment, and also uh, fully fund public education. And uh, the fact is, we have a $5.3 billion uh, budget surplus right now. <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, we can, we can easily do both things. And uh, as Mr. Abraham pointed out in the paper the other day, uh, you know, competitiveness is not just about taxes and regulation. It's about education and having a strong workforce and being able to uh, have uh, good uh, skilled workers for companies that are, are in Arizona already or want to come to Arizona. So uh, I just think we're kind of being presented with a false choice here. And it is part of an ongoing chronic underfunding of public education in Arizona. Uh, we are, I think as all candidates know here, we are either last or like one away from last in, uh, uh, in funding and teacher pay. And, uh, and again, you know, it depends on whether you count uh, Washington DC and it is just unacceptable for a state that has our economy and all of our vast resources and our potential to be in this situation. And we have this something uh, that, that we dealt with earlier this year in the legislature, fortunately, is we were able to waive the education expenditure clause and, and avoid this cliff of draconian 15% across the board cuts. And uh, we need to get rid of the education expenditure clause. We need to, whether through initiative or waiving it every year, we just, we, we shouldn't have a cap on public education education spending uh, in the state of Arizona, of all the things to cap, uh, to cap spending on education uh, just uh, seems nuts to me. So uh, uh, there you have it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Stratford. Thank you. Um, at the risk of sounding completely redundant, um, obviously, I think Governor Ducey and the legislature's uh, decision to slash Prop 208 is, it flies in the face of the will of the voters um, and it's completely unacceptable. The flat tax that they were talking about that was proposed in, in Prop 208 is a 3.5% tax on taxable income over $250,000. So we're talking about a very small tax on the wealthiest Arizonans this this would not affect people's income substantially um, and it would create substantial funding for education currently we are the 47th in the country for least educated and it doesn't have to be this way um, and it, it's ridiculous that schools and our students are continually the target of these kinds of cuts because in order to have a strong future for Arizona, that depends on us having highly educated people. We need to invest in our schools, invest in our students, and invest in the future of Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Verdon, you're up. I think you're still on mute. I know where you got it. Uh, uh, so as a quick reminder of what the question was, uh, it was about uh, what are voters telling policymakers with the votes, uh, the, the seemingly contradictory votes of uh, Doug Ducey winning, uh, winning office back in uh, 2018 and also the voters approving Prop 208 in the last election. 
Um, I think what voters are telling us with those two elections is that they don't want to pay too much in taxes themselves, but also most of us don't make over $250,000 a year. Somebody needs to pay for education, so it might as well be paid for the people most able to do so. That said, I think the premise of the question is a bit flawed. Uh, elections are complicated, and we can't assume, for instance, that Doug Ducey won purely on the message of cutting taxes. I mean, Arizona's income tax rate is already pretty low, so, so low that our government kind of struggles to perform a lot of its basic duties, including education. Um, but I think it also suggests that Arizonans are not, in fact, especially dedicated to the flat tax rate, as people have uh, just mentioned. Um, flat tax clearly benefits wealthier citizens and leaves poorer residents carrying more of the burden. Uh, Prop 208 clearly demonstrates that Arizonans, Arizonans think that wealthier residents should con contribute more to the state's well-being, and we can codify that in a progressive income tax rate that eases the burden on our poor residents and transfers that burden to those better able to bear it. All right. Thank you. And uh, last up on this question, we have Mr. Abraham. Awesome. So the question being, are voters satisfied with the current levels of education funding? And the answer would be a hard no. Um, when I give speeches around my community in, in Arizona, the one thing I love to do is get a poll of the audience and ask how many people were born in Arizona and how many people came here. And the vast majority of people, as we all know, moved to Arizona. They weren't born here. And the reason when you talk to these voters, these people, that they came to Arizona is because they saw Arizona as a place of quality public education and economic opportunity. Those two reasons are the exact two reasons my parents moved here. My dad immigrated to this country and my mom is a public school teacher and they both chose Arizona for the quality public school that we used to have. And until we restore that promise of Arizona, until we fully fund education to the levels that we saw you know, when I was a student and even before then, the voters are not going to be satisfied with the current level of public education. They keep voting, they keep saying it. We haven't made progress yet because of some court decisions and a Republican controlled legislature, but there's no question that we're on the right side of this issue and we are winning this issue with voters and they want to see change in our public schools and they want to fully fund our public schools to levels that we had previous. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Abraham. All right, that wraps up our responses to that question. And for folks who are just joining us, I wanna remind you that if you're a voter and uh, watching this debate right now, you can submit a question by email, text, or phone. So if you'd like to send an email, that's to debates at kc-a.com. If you wanna send a text, you can send that to 480-808-1814. Or you can call 480-937-1253. And please be prepared to give your question and say if it's for all the candidates or for a specific candidate. Um, and with that, uh, we'll go right ahead to a question that was submitted a few moments ago by a voter. And uh, for this one, Mr. Davis, you're going to be up first. Uh, that's just a warning. And uh, uh, this voter wrote in and, and they said, water is a finite resource. Agriculture uses about 70% of our state's annual water use and conservation alone will not get our state where it needs to be. Wells are already going dry in all parts of the state. How do you reconcile this with projections for our state's population growth? And what, if anything, do you think the legislature needs to do about water in our state? So, I recently went up to Lake Mead um, on a trip with my family um, up to Zion National, National Park. And <clears throat> that was the second time I've been there. The first time was uh, when I went with uh, my friend who, um, whose family had, had a boat and we had a great time on the lake. Um, when I went up there this time, Part of the area that we went to uh, about 10 years ago is currently about half a mile away from where the water is today. Um, the ramp that was built there um, is, it's so far away from where the water used to be that it now goes 50 feet beyond the ramp and then down a 30 foot drop. Um, our water's running out. 
And this is not an Arizona problem. This is a Western problem. You know, the Colorado River starts in Wyoming and it feeds seven states, tens of millions of Arizonans. Conservation is needed now in Arizona and across um, the Western United States. Um, this is going to be a problem if Arizona is, is going to hit that 10 million mark that we are projected to do by mid-century. Um, what it's going to need is investments um, in new technology um, for agriculture. That means new crops that can use less water. Um, in industry, it means being smarter with our water and using non-potable uh, non water when possible. And and this is concerning when you when I speak to water policy experts, they're saying we need to look into additional ways to get potable water, including turning um, currently used water into drinkable water. You know, we're going to face difficult questions um, moving forward. And this is one of the biggest reasons why I'm running. I was born here. I want to raise my family here. And in 2070, I want to be able to continue to live here into, um, into my retirement. And that's going to require action now. Any steps that we take in terms of uh, new regulations for additional construction or agriculture or um, uh, personal use, those are going to take time. And we're looking at, and we are quickly running out of time. Um, so, you know, this is, this is an issue that is incredibly complicated. Um, it's one that I am looking into, but, you know, that's why it's important that we elect leaders who will, are willing to recognize that climate change is real. It is happening now, and we have to take action now to ensure that Arizona remains a great place to live and move to. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you. I'm so glad that this question was asked because our water crisis is happening right now. Uh, many, um, many of the people in the legislature don't want to talk about it, but we are a desert and we are running out of water now. There are, uh, there's a neighborhood in North Phoenix that are, has million dollar homes and they are literally out of water. Uh, we, the hundred year water tables that subdivisions were required to have when they created the subdivision, they, they do not have hundred years. They don't even have 50 more left. So this is a crisis right now. And if we don't address it really aggressively, we are in big trouble. Uh, I don't want to move. I don't want my family to have to move. Um, one of the, one of the things that I think the legislature can do is, um, with agriculture, uh, set up systems and programs to help our agriculture change from very water heavy crops like cotton and alfalfa to other crops that will not be as water heavy. And that will take time and that will take uh, expertise and help and subsidies. But if, if that is something we can do, that's 70% of our water usage. Um, I think that employing water experts. We have, you know, great scientists in our state. We have universities that do this work and um, can provide us great resources on how to conserve and how to reach out to people. We need that now. We, look, we need to look into groundwater um, conservation, well water conservation, um, and just by acknowledging that this is a problem and we must talk about it, in, in the future legislation is, is of utmost importance. Um, you know, we want to be a, a state of growth and I think we can do that, but we cannot do that like we have. We cannot just blindly build uh, townhomes and, and subdivisions and golf courses and not think about the water that we're using. Something that we can do locally is um, not plant, plants that require a lot of water. When we moved to this house in 2007 from California, we were already used to conserving. And we pulled lots of um, water heavy bushes from our landscaping. We don't even have an, a water system in our house. My, my theory was if you can't survive in the desert as a plant in my yard, I'm sorry, your time is done. So it's, it's really, us, we as private citizens can do a lot. We have 
you know, fake grass in our backyard. It's lovely. We need to do those. Yes, they are little things, but combined with the larger things that the legislature can help with, we can make a difference. We have to. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And we'll move on to Mr. Mathis. I think Nathan and Nancy have teed it up uh, well. It's uh, uh, Morgan and I both serve in the House currently on the Natural Resources, uh, Energy, and, uh, and Water Committee. And uh, uh, the more that you look at this issue, this is one of these issues where the more you look at it, the more you learn about it, the more alarmed you become. And it doesn't really matter when you start and when you stop. It's just the more you learn about it, it's quite alarming. Um, uh, one uh, positive thing that has happened this year that I thought was great, it's one of the favorite bills that, uh, that we've passed in the past few months, uh, is a bill that would, it's a pilot program, $30 million to be uh, implemented by the University of Arizona uh, Cooperative Extension. And it's what has been mentioned before. It's focusing on converting agriculture to drip irrigation. And it is, the fact is, as the questioner notes, that agriculture uses you know, 70 plus percent of, uh, of the water. And, uh, and we need to find a way to to address that, and it's something we need to work on. And this is also one of these issues that is not an inherently partisan issue. And uh, there are regional aspects, there's you know, rural areas versus, versus cities, but it is, even if, uh, if, ag use, if ag use dries up, it doesn't take very long before we don't have any water in the cities anymore. So it's something we need to work together on. Uh, there is a proposal floating around that, that the governor has offered to uh, create this uh, a water board that would uh, be able to address some of these issues. Uh, it's again, it's uh, in its early stages, and as it's currently um, constituted, I'd be surprised if it's something that uh, any, if any, uh, members of the Democratic Caucus would be able to support. I think that that kind of thinking, as far as uh, trying to do something, something big and something uh, broad on this issue is what we need to do because it is alarming and it is literally the issue that will uh, decide our future. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Ms. Stratford. Thank you so much. Um, so I know that the original question stated that water conservation alone won't be enough, but I do think that there is a lot more that we could be doing with water conservation. Um, we really need to invest in our conservation efforts to make sure that we're being really efficient about our current use of water um, to, at the risk of being redundant again. Uh, over 70% of our water usage goes to agriculture. A lot of that goes to growing water heavy plants like alfalfa, as Nancy mentioned. Um, and I think when we look at water that way, we're really forgetting that we live in a desert. Um, so we need to have better statewide coverage with active management areas. Currently, I believe we only have two areas uh, with active management for water conservation. And we need to expand on that in order to have a full accounting of Arizona's water supply and recognize where that use is not sustainable in the long term. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Verdon. Yeah, uh, people, I don't want to rehash what everybody has said already. Uh, suffice to say, it's a very personal um, concern for me. Uh, if we run out of water here, this place will be uninhabitable, and I've already had to run once. I don't want to run again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like like everybody was saying, there's uh, lots of things we can be doing to, to conserve water. Uh, so we've got to be incentivizing people to do so, especially industries, especially the agriculture industry, which uses soap so much, uh, as well as looking into technologies to uh, generate more potable water through whether it's the desalination process or, you know, whatever it takes. Um, really, I'm open to suggestions. Uh, if this, if there was an easy solution to this, we would have already started on it. So um, this is an ongoing thing that I think all of the Western United States is working on. So um, we just got to keep our ears to the ground and keep focusing on it. Okay, thank you. And we'll come back now to Mr. Abraham. 
Thank you. I, I love talking about water. As Mr. Mathis said, we're both on the Natural Resources and Water Committee. And so it's, a, it's one of my key focus areas at the legislature. Um, the one thing I say, and I sound like a broken record if anyone's heard me before, when I talk about water is I give a shout out to Tucson and, and our AMA down here in Pima County, our active management area, because we are the model. Um, what we've done in Pima County over the last 40 and 50 years for our conservation and water management is incredible. We, we've not used any more water since 1990 and our, and our population has almost doubled. So Tucson leading the state as usual. Um, water is a wonderful subject because there's so much possibility. Um, we're in a crisis, there's no question. Um, we have to do something. And those two somethings are augmentation, bringing more water to Arizona and conservation, saving the existing water we have. Now, the majority of the Republican party at the legislature is all over augmentation. You probably read about it in the paper they are very focused on bringing more water to the state of Arizona. What, what I've made my job in the legislature is focusing on conservation, trying to promote um, conservation policies in this water authority so we can have a good balance of both. Because I think that's going to be the key to Arizona um, and, and sustaining our, our future is having a good balance of both augmentation and conservation. But again, promoting what Tucson's done, what we've already done is gonna be really important. What we've done in our active management area and to an extent what Maricopa County has done in their active management area and pushing that all across the state to make better water choices. All right, thank you. And uh, we'll go now to Ms. Sundaration. Um, I'm excited to have the last word on this question. Um, I teach natural resources law at the university. I've worked on water issues. I've written an academic article on some water law issues. And of course, we have so many experts right here at the University of Arizona who focus on water law and policy and are grappling with these issues of what are we going to do to be sustainable um, going into the future. Um, and we've, you know, a lot of the, the uh, facts and um, suggestions that other candidates here have discussed are, are worthy of consideration. And I'll just kind of uh, run through a, a whole uh, list of, um, of those and, and more, more importantly, the philosophy. And I think what we need to recognize is that supply is finite. Um, you know, we talk about Colorado River water. The Colorado River was allocated amongst the states in a year of of high flow. We've never seen the kind of flow in the Colorado River that ever since. Um, so we're already looking at finite flows, not to mention the impact of climate change exacerbating the mega drought that we're already in. So supply is finite, it's lowering. Um, and so what we need to be doing um, is not looking into new sources of water because getting there is going to be extremely difficult, expensive, time consuming. We won't, we won't find that in the time frame that we need. But we can look at conservation and efficiency, and those will get us to places where we need to go. Um, for example, uh, I want to emphasize that Tucson Water has done an incredible job of managing urban water use. Oops, sorry. Um, and, uh, and we've really reduced the water per capita uh, in our urban areas. Um, and so, you know, that's a great job we've done, but there's room for more. You know, groups here in Tucson, like Watershed Management Group, um, are able to provide information on how to use and reuse water um, in our urban lives, in, in our urban lives and in our yards so that we're not overusing our urban water sources. Similarly, um, agricultural and industrial water, there is lots of room for conservation and efficiency. Uh, groups like the Water for Arizona Coalition has identified a number of solutions that are the low hanging fruit that we can tap right now um, to improve our efficiency of water use. And we can get there. And then finally, the legislature certainly should act. We should be um, uh, expanding our Groundwater Management Act that Arizona was a leader on in 1980. And we haven't done any, we haven't done a lot since then, um, but we can expand those groundwater management, active management areas. Um, we can also allow rural communities uh, to opt in to those active management areas to manage their groundwater better themselves. Um, and we can also provide incentives for uh, those farms um, who want to switch uh, from, you know, uh, irrigate, field, flooded irrigation to drip or to switch from high water use crops to low water use crops. There's plenty to do. I'm optimistic. If we can just get the will together, we can do it. All right. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, and I'll just do a, a quick roll call again for folks that have joined us since our last question. We're here talking with seven Democratic candidates who want to represent Legislative District 18 in the state legislature. We have two candidates for Senate, Morgan Abraham and Priya Sundaration. We have five candidates for House, Nathan Davis, Nancy Gutierrez, Chris Mathis, Kat Stratford, and Charlie Verdon. And all right, uh, for our next question, Ms. Gutierrez, you're gonna be up first. This is also coming from a voter. Uh, Arizona is known as one of the states with a, a tougher criminal justice code. There have been efforts in recent years to make reforms, but for the most part, they haven't come to fruition at the legislative level. What's one criminal justice reform you would fight tirelessly for at the legislature and would be willing to be a one-term lawmaker to get it done? Uh, I think you're still on mute. There you go. I know. You'd think after a year of teaching on Zoom, I'd know how to unmute myself. Okay. Thank you so much for that question. I appreciate it. We... Arizona needs criminal justice reform. Uh, we, we know that our criminal justice system is uh, biased and um, racist. And something that I would work on as a candidate is really reducing that school to prison pipeline. That is something that is real. Uh, we see our students who are underserved in poor communities um, and we don't have the resources to help them, such as uh, support specialists, people who can go into their communities and help them understand their needs and get them to school more often so that they can be successful. And what happens is those students unfortunately drop out and they end up in the prison system. I believe that private prisons are a huge part of this issue because as far as private prison owners are concerned, um, you know, they're getting the money uh, for these students, whether they're in charter schools or private schools. I, I truly believe that is something that our public funds um, have been diverted to and it's, and it's a huge injustice. So I would absolutely work to put policies in place that guide money to education so that more students can graduate with uh, high school diplomas with uh, CTE degrees so they can go right into um, the workforce uh, who, who can have um, do apprenticeships with local unions because they are very willing to do that so that they do not end up in the prison system like they have been. Yeah, so I think what I think what Nancy said is, is exactly right. I also run the House Judiciary Committee, and you know we're talking about criminal justice reform and ways to uh, reduce uh, sentences often. And uh, I feel like most of the bills that came through our committee this year um, did the opposite of that, actually. Um, so that was uh, that was disappointing. As Democrats, we voted against those bills, but we are a minority on the on the committee. One thing that we did talk about a lot that I think there was broad agreement on is what Nancy was talking about is trying to do everything we can to focus on that the school to prison pipeline and folks who are uh, teen offenders and getting up into the later teen years and making sure that we are, uh, again, doing everything we can to make sure that uh, they don't stay in the system for uh, a long period of time and that we're able to do everything we can to change that trajectory. And of course that helps, um, that helps those folks, that helps their families, it also saves the state an incredible amount of money. And, uh, and so that is, I think the one reform, that's the one reform area uh, that I would, would uh, like to focus on. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I apologize, I didn't get off mute, but I appreciate that you know what to do and, and jumped right into it. Uh, We'll go next to Ms. Stratford. Thank you so much. I am tickled to answer this question because criminal justice reform is something that I've been studying for years and I feel very passionate about. Um, there's a lot of things that I think we could do to address some of the injustices that we see here in Arizona. Um, 
and some of the policies that I really want to push forward um, if I win my seat in the legislature are policies that could make the expungement process automatic. Currently, we in 2020, we voted to legalize recreational use of marijuana. And there is an expungement process that people can go to. They have to go to clinics um, to actually like get that paperwork started and going. It's a process. Other states have it where that process is automated. So as soon as that law went into effect, everyone with a marijuana conviction um, would have been automatic, would have had that automatically expunged from their record. Additionally, I think it's important that we make it easier for felons to get their civil rights restored in order to vote. It's vital that the people who have experienced the worst parts of our criminal justice system have a voice in reforming that through voting. Um, I also believe strongly that we need to be examining how we address public safety because the number one correlating factors that are tied to spikes in violent crime are things like unemployment, housing insecurity, food insecurity, those are all things that lead to spikes in violent crime. And if we were to focus more on addressing these issues, we could really see a lowering in, in those levels of crime, which is vital since last year we broke a record um, in terms of homicide here in Tucson. So thank you. Great, thank you. And we'll go next to Mr. Bird. Yeah, uh, preempted me a little bit, but uh, that's all right, because I think it bears repeating, because uh, this might not sound like a big criminal justice reform issue, uh, but I would fight to give felons the right to vote. I don't think it's right for anybody to have their right to vote stripped for them for any reason. And moreover, I think it's important that people should have a say in the laws that put them in prison. Um, and then there's the fact that prisoners are often used to inflate the populations of the districts that they're in and allow those uh, districts to be overrepresented uh, in legislatures compared to their actual voting populations. So yes, I would absolutely serve a single term if that meant I could enfranchise prisoners. All right, straight to the point. We like that. Um, and uh, next we have Mr. Abraham. Yes, so the one area I would serve one term for would be mandatory minimums. Um, I do not like mandatory minimums. I have voted against every single mandatory minimum increase at the legislature this year. I am sometimes alone in that vote. It is quite a weird feeling when you are the only one red on a board full of 59 greens, but it's something that I'm passionate about. And it, it stems from my life experiences, one of them being my time in the Army still am in the army, but um, in the army, we have a principle called mission command. And it's actually what makes the American military so amazing. And it's this principle that decisions are made by the leaders that have the most information on the ground. Instead of the, the general in Washington, DC, it's the lieutenant on the ground that's leading his troops. And that's how I look at the criminal justice system. I don't like handcuffing judges for uh, mandatory minimum sentences. I think judges should have all the power um, to sentence based on the facts that they see. Um, mandatory minimums are friction. They are handcuffs to, to make better choices, and I'm not a fan of them, and that's why I have and will continue to vote against every increase in mandatory minimums, and sometimes I'm all by myself, but that is okay. All right. Thank you, and uh, we'll go now to Ms. Sundaration. Um, a lot of fabulous suggestions by our candidates here. Um, and in particular, I, I do love the uh, expansion of voting rights. I think that's absolutely, as a voting rights advocate, something that I can get behind. I'll also mention um, that we should be increasing funding for public defenders. I know that our public defenders work incredibly hard and they don't get the resources that they need and they carry a caseload of, of too many clients to be able to focus appropriately on defending um, on defending their clients. And everybody deserves a lawyer and everybody deserves a lawyer that can give them the attention that they need. Um, so I want to talk, I would, I would focus on increasing that funding. And then I also want to point out that we recently, within the last couple of days, um, saw that there was an expose on the, uh, the fact that Arizona prisons are not providing mental health treatment to uh, the people that are in their custody. And that is a travesty. Um, you know, we're not only, you know, and as, as was mentioned earlier, our prison, prisons being used as a profit center 
Um, but we are also denying people the health care that they need. And it's likely increasing recidivism and, and it's not contributing to our goals of safe of a safe society. Um, so I would I would want to explore more there and see what we could do at the legislator uh, legislature to address that issue. All right. Thank you. And uh, our last but not least candidate to talk about criminal justice, we got Mr. Davis. So I actually thought <clears throat> uh, this was going to get brought up, but one of the things that we saw during the pandemic when um, you know everybody was getting uh, 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 the disinfectant to you know clean their facilities or wash their hands one of the places that it came from was our prisons and one of the reasons it came from our prisons is because the 13th amendment which abolished slavery did not abolish it did not abolish forced labor for those who have been convicted of crimes. So we have people, you know, who are incarcerated, who are making pennies an hour, um, uh, sometimes being forced to, to, to do labor in, in difficult conditions, um, such as during the pandemic. Um, and I think that that is completely unjust. I think that is a perverse incentive to lock people up and to use them for, for cheap labor. I do want to point out one other thing, though, because the policy that I think would be incredibly important, and I think this needs to be repeated, is we must fully fund our public education system and expand public education. Um, I and um, uh, Morgan have both called for universal preschool education. What we see is when you have investments in children, especially in public education, that leads to lower incidences of incarceration. Um, it is incredibly important that we prevent um, uh, prevent these issues, and that starts with investing in families and investing in children. Okay. Can I just add one quick thing, Nick, to my to my comment? Since sure. I went first, thank you. I don't see why not. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I agree with all of my colleagues. Um, and I just, with the, with the school to prison pipeline in Arizona, we spend a little over $5,000 per student and we spend over $20,000 per prisoner. Now I'm not saying that that spending needs to come away from prisoners, but they should be treated humanely and have health care and have mental health care and have education. But in a state that we, we have clearly uh, shown what our priorities are and until their education and until we back that up with money we are not going to have a just um, criminal justice system. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I've got a pretty straightforward question for all you folks. So uh, maybe we can just go right down the line with this one. Uh, we're gonna start this time with Mr. Mathis. And the question from a voter who wrote in is, will you commit to sponsoring or co-sponsoring legislation to repeal right to work in Arizona? Yes. All right. Uh, Ms. Stratford. Absolutely, I would. Same here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Abraham. Yes, I, I can't just say it, uh, one thing, but I will to do my best to keep it short, I, I am of the belief that um, too much profits are going to um, companies and not labor. And anything I can do to strengthen labor's hand in that process um, is something I want to be able to do as a policymaker. So yes. Okay, we'll see if anybody wants to step out of line on this one. Ms. Sundaration. Uh, I'll also say yes, and that uh, the right to work has often been used as a way to undermine unions. And so um, it, is, it is certainly something that we should get rid of. Mr. Uh, so yes, I uh, am in favor of repealing that. I do want to say that I don't call it that. I call it anti-labor, um, anti-worker. Um, it is a constitutional amendment that got it on there in the 90s. It will require the voters to weigh in on it. And that is a fight that I look forward to campaigning um, to campaigning for to, uh, to repeal that. I also want to say that um, if anyone in any of the... Uh, newly unionized um, Star, uh, Starbucks in Arizona is listening. Congratulations. And I look forward to helping your colleagues, your coworkers down here in Tucson. Okay. 
and Ms. Gutierrez. Yes, I would repeal it. I am a proud union member of the Teachers Union, uh, Tucson Education Association, and I would absolutely repeal that. Okay. Um, all right, and we're gonna go now to a question about disability services. Uh, for this one, Ms. Stratford, you're gonna be up first. And the question that we have from a voter is, the funding for people with developmental disabilities in this state is insufficient. The process for getting services and the people who get them um, uh, are, uh, are not working the way they should. If you have the power to change this, what can you do? As a parent of a 28-year-old daughter with Down syndrome, what can I do? I know the state's needs for funding is high. I want all of you to know my daughter is important too. I'm thrilled to be the first one answering this question as a disabled parent myself. Um, I'm actually talking to you all using closed captions and hearing aids. Um, and it's almost impossible for someone like me to even access disability funding. It's extremely underfunded. Um, it's extremely difficult to get through the system. So one of the things that I'm hoping to fight for in the legislature is removing some of those obstacles. It's the same kind of obstacles that I talked about in, in my opening speech where I talked about the difficulties in dealing with bureaucracy and trying to apply for uh, social security disability funding and, and things like that. And also the cap on that is incredibly low. People can't survive on that, especially people with specific medical needs. And additionally, uh, we also have a huge issue with disabled students being accommodated in our public schools. Um, it, I have a special needs child and it required going to five schools in one year in order to get her a 504 plan. That's completely bananas, unacceptable. The amount of driving I had to do was wild. So we need to be investing more in our schools, special education systems. We need to be investing more in our in our disabled community. And we need to normalize talking about these subjects because chances are someone you know is disabled. Someone you know has a child or family member who is severely disabled. And so we need to make sure that they are well represented in our state legislature and somebody is fighting for them. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Stratford. On to you, Mr. Verdon. Yeah, I really wish I knew more about uh, what we could do because it's not something I've had to uh, experience in my own life. So uh, I'm afraid I don't have the experience I need to be able to make suggestions. So on that note, I would highly recommend that anybody who has uh, thoughts on the matter, please get in touch with me uh, or and I will also uh, intend to reach out to uh, organizations that could help me uh, properly understand this. Um, but I think that in general, uh, as Kat noted, uh, you know, if it's extremely difficult to get through the bureaucracy to get the assistance that you need, then a lot of people end up just not doing it. Uh, and that is not acceptable. And for in a lot of cases, that just leads to people. I mean, sometimes it leads to people ending up on the streets because they just don't have the support that they need. And uh, it's adding to a lot of, well, I mean, we, we experience a lot of homelessness here in Tucson, uh, in part because of that issue, I assume. Um, so I think that we need to look at how we provide our services and uh, improve accessibility uh, as much as possible. But yeah, I'm afraid I don't have too much else I can say right now. Okay, that's all right. Um, we'll go to Mr. Abraham. So thank you for the question. I, I, I mentioned earlier that my mom is a teacher, a public school teacher, and she's actually, she teaches the, uh, students with developmental disabilities. Um, so this is an area I, I know pretty well just from growing up in her household and um, seeing her experience teaching. Uh, the, the question was, what can we do on developmental disabilities? And the answer is a lot, um, specifically around the education area. Um, I've seen firsthand the lackluster resources our public schools get for um, students with developmental disabilities. 
Um, I've seen the facilities. I've seen the, the classrooms. We need to do more. Um, it's actually an area that I, I um, ran a bill on and um, trying to promote and, and add more resources to the classrooms because as we all know, um, it, it's more expensive to educate students with developmental disabilities because they're, they, they're, there's more um, attention and more resources that are needed. And so as, as a state legislature, I think we need to recognize that and continue to fund it. Um, so classrooms like my mom's are properly funded and have the resources um, necessary. Thank you. Ms. Sundaresha? Um, yes. Uh, so I'm not the expert and I'm welcome just more further discussion on, on these questions, but uh, it does occur to me that with our $5.3 billion surplus, certainly the state can be providing more resources and more support and funding into disability resources. And um, second, I think we would look, we should look into enforcement and compliance with the ADA and, um, and also, you know, reach out to your school board. I know that schools are required to provide individualized educational plans. And so make sure that um, your school is providing what it's supposed to be. And then as a last resort, there's a fabulous organization, the Arizona Center for Disability Law, who might be able to help um, advise on, on next steps uh, for, our, for our voter who called in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis. To the voter who did, um, provide this question. Uh, I just want to say that I'm, I'm so sorry that you've had to, you know, go through this without the support that, that you and your family need. Um, you know, like, like Morgan, uh, my parent, uh, my dad was a special education teacher. And one of the things that he always did for his kids at, at Choya was to help them learn the skills that they could then take to, to get a job and to live on their own. Um, and you know he was a great he was a great teacher, um, and he started here in the '80s when Arizona's education system was about the median in the nation, and we've seen that just decline over the decades. Um, my first year as a teacher, we had a great special education team. Both of those teachers left, and for the next two years, we struggled to get a consistent special education teacher. And during that time, my colleagues and I were left to figure it out on our own, which, which was a disservice to those students who needed a specialist to help them. Um, you know, like, like Priya has mentioned, we have a $5.3 billion surplus. There is no reason why any school should struggle to find a special education teacher, why any student should not get the services that they need because there's no one, um, there's no one there to serve them. Um, you know, and no parent should have to do what Kat did and have to move to a different school to get the services. It's completely unacceptable. And it is done on by a choice um, by the legislature failing to fulfill its obligations to the people. This is a huge reason why I'm running um, and something that we must fix. All right, thank you. Ms. Gutierrez. Hi, thanks. Um, well, as a teacher at Tucson High, I, I teach yoga, which is a physical education class, and I am lucky enough to have uh, students with um, developmental disabilities and autism in my classroom, because and mine is often the only regular ed class that they go to. And I will tell you that I have, I have learned more from those students than any other, and that we all value them in our classroom. They bring a lot of joy and a lot of learning to us. Um, and I've seen at Tucson High, wonderful special education teachers and who reach out to the community. And we have community partnerships where when students are in their last year of school at Tucson High, which usually we keep them a good five years, that's legal. Um, and the last year is spent going and learning jobs in the community with goodwill, with, with great, great resources that we have. Um, but not all school districts are equal. Not all school districts provide this for their students. And so then students have to switch districts in order to get this. It does come down to funding. We must fund our schools. And special education, exceptional education, deserves just as much funding. They deserve all of the things that any other child gets in our state. Um, so it's possible. 
we have the resources. We know who the experts are. We have wonderful, amazing teachers who've spent their life serving these amazing children. We just have to have the money in order to do this. And I will fight like a teacher to provide that because um, they're worth it. All right. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Mathis. Well, first off, what a great question. And I think that this kind of question points up uh, the uh, strength of this type of a debate format, because it's one that, frankly, we don't often get to. And uh, it's one of the most important things we can be talking about. And it gets to this question of what kind of state do we want to have? What kind of society do we want to be? Uh, there are resources out there to devote to this. And as we've heard, uh, there's a deficit. And um, uh, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. $5.3 billion surplus. Let's address it. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you, folks, for your words on that question. Um, I'm going to let everyone know we have one more question, and uh, then we're going to go ahead to uh, closing statements because we are already past seven o'clock here. Um, our next question is going to be another voter submitted question, uh, but I'm going to take the liberty of uh, tacking my own uh, follow up onto it. And uh, for this one, uh, Mr. Verdon, you're going to be on the hot seat answering first. And we had a voter write in, women's rights are consistently under attack right now from reproduction to protection against violence. What experiences do you have that make you able to understand and protect the rights of women in Arizona? That's from our voter. And I'm gonna add for you, um, we've had our uh, conservative legislator, excuse me, legislators enact a law this session that would uh, restrict women's right to uh, receive an abortion after 15 weeks of a pregnancy. And so my question for you all is, what new parameters to abortions, if any, do you believe would be justified? All right. And uh, so with that, Mr. Verdon, please go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, simply put, uh, oh, sorry, I told them. Sorry, kids came home. Uh, <laughs> um, simply put, I don't think it's the uh, it's the right of any legislature to start telling uh, women what they can do to, with their bodies. Um, as far as personal experiences with. Uh, what women have experienced, I mean, uh, it's very limited <laughs> for me because uh, I've, uh, I've, I grew up in a household where there were a lot of very powerful women who taught me how to respect uh, and treat women <laughs> with respect as well. Uh, and so whenever I grew up and learned more about uh, misogyny that it really baffled me and I never could wrap my head my head around that that mindset um so I've had to spend a lot more time actually studying the effects and uh trying to do my best to be a, a force to reverse that uh, in my own company uh we actively promote women most of the uh the highest positions in my company are filled by women uh, we have, you know, striven for an equal pay uh, uh, pay rate. Uh, my wife actually makes more than me. I hope I don't mind. Uh, she doesn't mind me putting her on blast like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, all I know is that I do what I can to try to uh, to bridge that gap and uh, try to teach my kids to do the same. Thank you. And we'll go to Mr. Abraham. So for the question of what um, what women's health restrictions would I support? The answer is none. Um, I adamantly opposed the 16 week abortion. Um, I fought it tooth and nail on the floor. I fought it off the floor. I did my best to um, find anyone to, to stop that. I think that's terrible policy and that's not the Arizona I want. And I will do everything in my power to repeal that and continue to fight for a women's right to choose and pro-abortion policy. Um, what I do about it is I fight. 
Um, I, I, I do my best at the legislature to make sure bills like these don't even see the light of day. And then when they do, we debate them on the floor. And I donate. I donate to wonderful uh, women's healthcare organizations like Planned Parenthood. Um, and I follow their lead. Um, so the answer is no. We, we are not going to continue to move in this direction of restricting a women's uh, right to choose, restricting women's health care choices. Um, and we're going to fight back and we're going to repeal that law and we're going to continue to have a state that respects uh, a women's body and their choice. Thank you. Ms. Sundaration. Um, absolutely. No new parameters, certainly no new parameters um, to add to abortion. What we have on the books uh, with our Arizona legislature, even what we've passed this session is already too extreme. Not to mention, we've had we have a book, a law on the books that goes back over a century um, that should the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court uh, overturn Roe v. Wade would make abortion a criminal offense. Um, these are extremely extreme positions for our legislature to take and it jeopardizes the health and safety of women. And um, to the, the voters question, I have a, a very personal experience with these issues. I, as I mentioned earlier, have a seven week old. I recently gave birth to a baby. So I remember being pregnant. It was just, you know, a couple months ago. And I can tell you that uh, this 15 week abortion that the legislature just, uh, abortion ban that the legislature just passed um, is incredibly concerning. And as, as I was watching that bill go through and they, they passed one last year as well, um, you know, I was, I was watching horrified, terrified because I can tell you that at, at, um, I wasn't able to get my first doctor's appointment about my pregnancy just to learn anything about it until 11 weeks. And so by 15 weeks, there's no medical information that I know uh, from that a doctor can tell me anything about the health of the pregnancy, about whether the pregnancy is going to harm uh, my life or the, the baby's life. Um, and so, you know, having laws like this on the books is just incredibly uh, short-sighted, not to mention cruel uh, to, to treat women in Arizona this way. Thank you. Mr. Davis. So I want to just say this out, outright and upfront. The GOP will not stop at a 15 week ban. Pre already mentioned there's a law in the books that, you know, if the court completely overturns um, Roe v. Wade and Casey and throws it completely to the states, um, it will, you know, trigger and abortions will be um, illegal. You know, the plan for the Republicans is to criminalize abortion. We saw that in tech, we're, we're seeing that in Texas, we're seeing that across the country. For my personal experiences, and this is for anyone who's run for public office, you know, this is a, can be a tough thing, but everything comes out. Um, when I was you know, much younger, I had a um, partner and, and we had a, um, uh, an, an accidental pregnancy. Um, after discussions, um, we agreed that an abortion would be the best means the best way forward for both of us. We're both very young um, and we agreed that we could not raise a, a child um, uh, in those conditions. I have taken loved ones to, to clinics to have um, an abortion procedure. It is an incredibly tough decision. And the Republicans want to make it seem like this is a flippant thing that, that, women, that women do. It's not. It never is for anyone involved. This is one of the, you know, this is one of the hardest decisions that, that people have to make sometimes. And I want to answer, you know, Nick, I want to answer your question directly. Um, you know, what, um, uh, you know, what, what would I say if I was in the legislature and this came up? I would say that this is a decision for the person who's pregnant. This is their decision, their decision alone. Um, you know, abortion care is health care, and health care is a human right. And it's, it's really time that we elect Democrats who, who can say that. And I think that is incredibly important. All right. Thank you. And we'll go to Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this question. Um, in 2018, I was the president of the Tucson chapter of the National Organization for Women. So I am a huge proponent of women's rights. 
I would absolutely um, support my my fellow colleagues who have um, put bills in policy into uh, pass equal rights amendment in Arizona. One should be passed nationally, and I would support that wholeheartedly. Um, protecting women, I, I'm also a gun sense candidate with Moms Demand Action because we know that women are overtly affected by um, gun uh, incidents, and I believe that we should have stronger um, gun legislation in this state to protect women and families. Um, I absolutely want the VAWA to be uh, passed in our in our national legislature and would support that as well. As far as abortion care, abortion care is health care, and I support a person's right to have an abortion. I think Roe v. Wade, is it, it has worked for us since the 70s. The parameters there, which is 24 weeks gestation, is, is absolutely good. We don't need any further restrictions. And actually, our state needs to fund programs like Planned Parenthood even more. I have had students who, um, you know, they can't talk to their families about birth control. They can't talk to their families about abortion. And they come and talk to me. Um, you know, teachers need to teach real sex education so that our students are informed about their bodies, about how their bodies work, and about how they can protect themselves. So I am a huge proponent of all of these policies and would absolutely put policies into place that protect abortion, repeal this new 15-week uh, ban, and protect our women's health. Thank you. And uh, move on to Mr. Mathis. So as far as the legislature goes, this 15-week ban was unconstitutional when it went through the Rules Committee. It was unconstitutional when it went through the Judiciary Committee. It was unconstitutional when it went to the floor uh, and passed on a party line vote. And it was unconstitutional when the governor signed it. Uh, as others have said, uh, the Roe v. Wade framework has worked for 50 years. I, I support that framework. I would support no new restrictions. As far as uh, in my own life, I've known a number of folks who have been able to make a, uh, a safe and thoughtful choice on this, this topic. And I want them to continue to be able to do that. Uh, so I'll do everything that I can to fight any new restrictions and any uh, lessening of the Roe v. Wade protections. Thank you. And our last candidate on this question is Ms. Stratford. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start with the voters question, but I first want to mention that the attacks on reproductive rights do not just affect women. Um, I am the proud mother of a trans son, um, and this law affects him as well. So it's not just a women's issue. It's an issue that affects a lot of people. Um, and in terms of an experience that I have, I, I have several, but the one I want to share with you is that I recently just took a trip to visit my mother's birthplace. It was a maternity home for unwed mothers. My biological grandmother, who, I, who I've never met, um, uh, she became pregnant at the age of 19 and was sent away from her home and her family to a maternity home where she had to be hidden away from the public and give birth and then was forced to give up her child, my mother, um, after having cared for her for six weeks. She named her Judith. Uh, she, she probably loved this child. Um, we obviously never got a chance to ask her, um, but she was forced to give that child up because this happened in 1947, decades before Roe v. Wade. 20 years later, my mother would find herself in the exact same situation, pregnant, unwed, and too young to handle that. She had access to a choice. Um, and because she made the choice to abort that child, she was able to start a family later on when it was right for her. And that's why I'm sitting here fighting for our reproductive rights. Because when we went to visit that maternity home, the weight of, her name was Rachel, uh, my biological grandmother, the weight of Rachel's 
inability to choose in that situation just felt so crushing when we visited this place and then visited her grave afterwards. Um, so this is a very personal issue for me. Um, I, I view my life as a legacy of somebody not having the choice. Um, and so I will continue to fight for reproductive rights. And to answer, uh, to answer your question, Mr. Phillips, I don't believe there should be any restrictions on a person's right to an abortion. Um, during the 1940s, when my, my mother was born, illegal back alley abortions accounted for 40% of maternal deaths because we know that restrictions on abortions don't actually reduce the number of abortions. They just reduce the number of women who survive them. And so we need to clear the way for people to have access to choices that are right for them without any restrictions. And if we want to actually reduce the number of abortions, then we should be increasing access to birth control and sex education. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. Um, we're now gonna go ahead to our, uh, the final portion of tonight's debate and that's the closing statements. Uh, we're actually right back to where we started. So we're gonna begin this one with Mr. Abraham again. And um, the, I'm asking everyone to limit your closing statements to one minute. You've actually been great so far. Uh, almost all the responses have been under two minutes. I've been keeping track. I don't know if you have been, but it's mostly worked out. Um, and and uh, if you don't mind, if uh, for anyone who's, who's joined us recently, if you want to begin your closing statement by saying your name again and whether you're running for uh, the House or the Senate. So uh, with that, Mr. Abraham, please. So I'm Morgan Abraham. Um, I'm currently a member of the House and I'm running for the State Senate. And in my opening remarks, I told you who I was. And now I wanna tell you why I am running and or continuing to run. Um, and that's simple. I wanna live in an Arizona that upholds the values my parents instilled in me. Uh, my mother, Ginger, was a, is a school teacher. Um, she taught me about the challenges and rewards of living a, a life of service, but also taught me about how education was the great equalizer. And with a good education, anyone can have the opportunity for a better life for themselves. My dad is an immigrant. He came here to this country with no money and no college degree. But what he did have is a tremendous work ethic and, and a, a desire to have a better life for his children. And he helped me realize the importance of the system with economic opportunity. He fought to make a better life for me and my family. I am fighting for those values that my parents instilled in me, the importance of education and economic opportunity here in Arizona. It was our American dream. It was our Arizona dream. But then I, was, then I learned that the Arizona dream has its risks. During the Great Recession, I watched my parents lose everything. They lost their house, they filed bankruptcy, and I learned that the deck is stacked against working families. And that's why I'm running. I'm running because I deeply care about economic opportunity and properly funding education in this state. I wanna restore the promise, the promise that Arizona had to my parents, the promise that Arizona gave my family a better life and more opportunity than my parents had. And that promise that is slipping away because of Republican cuts to education and the other economic building blocks. So my name's Morgan Abraham. I'm currently serving in the house fighting for that promise, and now I want to fight in the Senate. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Ms. Sundaration. Hi, everyone. I'm Priya Sundaration. Again, I am running for the state Senate. I want to fight to make Arizona a leader in renewable energy. I want to restore balance to our water issues, mainly through conservation and efficiency, and I want to improve our democracy by making voting as easy and accessible to all. Um, I bring experience in my career in environmental law and in advocacy and in voting rights advocacy as well. And I will take that experience and my legal background to the legislature where I will apply it to reading bills and making sure that I um, fully understand everything that's going through. Um, I'm a teacher, I'm a union member, and I'm a mom. So I uh, can understand what working families are going through right now. And uh, so I would be very honored to have your vote to send me to the state Senate for LD18. Um, I want to make sure that Arizona um, is a great place to grow up as I did here in Tucson. 
Um, and I want my children and all children to be inheriting a sustainable world and a sustainable Arizona. All right. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Hi, my name is Nathan Davis, um, and I'm running for the Arizona House in LD18. I am the only candidate running who has experience teaching in a K-12 classroom at our public school, um, was a union member, and uh, is, has experience running a small business um, here in Arizona. And I'm fighting to in fully invest in public education. That means not only fully funding our K-12 system, but that means creating a universal preschool um, program, which we can do with the budget surplus that we have right now without raising a dime. Um, combating climate change, building resiliency in our community and, uh, and generating electricity here through wind and solar rather than importing coal and gas from out of state. Um, I am also fighting to defend our democracy, um, expanding access um, to the ballot by restoring the permanent early voter list um, and implementing automatic and same day voting registration um, for the voters of Arizona. And finally, to protect legal abortion care and expand healthcare access in the state. Um, I am fighting to keep Arizona sustainable so that we can continue to live here throughout this century and so that people can enjoy the state which I was born and raised in and which I love so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And we'll go to Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you. My name is Nancy Gutierrez and I'm running for the Arizona State House in LD18. I am a current high school teacher and I started my career teaching in Arizona in 1994 and have taught everything from preschool up through community college math. I'm married. I've been married for 26 years to my husband, Andy, and we have two daughters that we have raised here in Tucson since 2007. I believe wholeheartedly in public schools, and I want to be a teacher's voice in our state house. I will fight for a fair, equitable education for all of our students. But I've also been a member of this community since 2007 as a teacher, as a yoga teacher at Yoga Oasis, and as an advocate. I was president of the Tucson chapter of NOW. I was president of Manzanita Elementary School. I've worked hard to make this community my community and thrive for everyone. Um, I was a military wife when my husband and I were first married. He was in the Army, and so um, we both served in that way. I want to protect our voting rights. I think that voting should be convenient. Um, I will protect our water. I will, will fight for rights of all people to have health care. I humbly ask for your vote. And I also ask that you reach out to me at nancy4az.com. We haven't gotten to all the issues. I'm here to learn. And I would love to hear from the voters of LD18. Thank you so much. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Mathis. Hi, I'm Chris Mathis. I am a lawyer and I teach law at the University of Arizona. I was appointed to the legislature in December for LD9. I'm running for a full term in the new LD18 in the House. Uh, the reason I'm running is to bring Tucson values to Phoenix. Uh, I'm running uh, because we need to invest in public education. We need uh, to fight climate change, and we need to protect voting rights and reproductive rights. I appreciate uh, everybody tuning in. I appreciate my colleagues participating in the debate. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Clean Elections. And I would appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Straffer. First, I just wanted to say thank you so much to my fellow candidates for being here and to Clean Elections for hosting. And Nick, thank you so much for moderating. Um, I really appreciate the enabling of captions as it gives me access to a forum like this. And I'll close by saying that my name is Kat Stratford. I'm running to be the first ASL speaking member of the deaf and hard of hearing community to become a lawmaker in Arizona. I'm running to fight for my children's rights and their future. And that includes trans rights, voting rights, and reproductive rights, and as well as the right to a quality education, which is something that I believe that everyone in Arizona is entitled to. 
Thank you so much. I look forward to working, continuing to work through this campaign for a stronger, more equitable Arizona. You can find me at catforaz.com. Thank you so much. Um, and that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Verdon, you're going to have uh, the final word uh, with our closing statements here. So please go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Bye. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, everyone, I'm Charlie Verdon, uh, running for the uh, Arizona State House of Representatives. Thank you all for watching. And a big thank you to uh, Kat, Nancy, Nathan, and Chris for also running for the House, as well as our Senate candidates, uh, Priya and Morgan, for joining us. Uh, I think any of us would be a great addition to the Arizona legislature, and I really look forward to seeing who the voters choose to move on to the general election. Uh, I've learned a lot from this debate. Um, I know I favor brevity, perhaps even a bit too much, uh, but that's because I'm a listener by nature. I'm an expert on very little. Uh, I'm just a business owner, successful now, though we struggled for many years, uh, and I'm just trying to do what I can to help this place where I live. Um, I've often found that the best way I can do that is to just shut up and listen to the experiences and suggestions of people who have lived different lives from me. Uh, listen, learn, and then act decisively. That's how I've gotten where I am. And I think that's what ele elected officials should do. I think that should be the job. Um, I hope you'll give me the chance to listen to you. Uh, if you'd like to meet me to have someone lend you an ear, you can get in touch with me on my website, charlieverdon.com. Again, I am a clean elections candidate, so my campaign will only be funded if I can collect $205 uh, qualifying contributions. You can donate securely through the Arizona Secretary of State's website, which is at azsos.gov. Uh, just log into the eQual system and donate qualifying contributions to as many clean elections as you can. It's uh, an extremely uh, easy way to support a lot of very good candidates. Um, again, I'm Charlie Verdon. I'm running for the State House of Representatives, and I look forward to meeting and talking to all of you. Thank you again for listening. All right. Thank you, Mr. Verdon. And uh, that's going to conclude our debate this evening. So to all the candidates, thank you so much for participating, especially uh, here on Zoom. I know this can be difficult, but uh, thanks for helping me uh, make everything run smoothly. And uh, even though we had uh, seven candidates, which is quite a few this evening, uh, I'm glad we got to talk about a number of different topics. And to the voters who are turned in, uh, tuned in right now, uh, thank, thank you for taking the time to watch the debate, inform yourselves before our August 2nd primary election. And a special thank you to those who submitted questions. I apologize to those of you whose questions we didn't get to, but you heard some of the candidates just now mention uh, their contact information. A number of our candidates tonight have websites. And if they don't, all of them are uh, registered through the Arizona Secretary of State and using the Secretary of State website, you can find contact information for their campaign. So I would encourage all voters to uh, reach out directly to the candidates with any more questions you have. I hope they'll uh, get in touch with you. As a reminder, the voter registration deadline is July 5th and early voting begins July 6th. All registered voters, including independents, can participate in the primary. And we encourage you to visit azcleanelections.gov for official, accurate voting information. Thank you again and good night.